So I've done a bunch of research and a lot of work as a data scientist and ML engineer, and I kept finding myself facing the same problem, which is that there's some SQL database or some spreadsheets of high value but sensitive data that I just can't get access to. And that ends up being one of these major blockers. And it's like dying of thirst in the ocean. You're completely surrounded by water, but you can't drink any of it. And that's how it feels with some of the sensitive data. Um, and so I looked into it and I'm not the only one. This is a huge bottleneck uh, in, in uh, research and industry um, and particularly in sort of healthcare, finance and biotech uh, domains. Um, and this, this keeps on coming up. And, you know, the obvious first question is, can't we just anonymize the data? Um, and the answer is, well, no, because higher dimensional data just becomes very sparse and our machine learning tools are really powerful. Um, and so there's lots of examples of researchers recovering exact records um, and re-identifying individuals along with their personal data. So, I mean, this was done for half of the US population from census statistics. Um, and uh, the, the famous Netflix challenge had anonymized data and researchers were able to uh, re-identify viewers along with their watch history ratings. And I think there's a few uh, court cases that have, that have happened uh, over a result of this. Uh, so anonymization alone isn't enough. Um, but personal data privacy is great. Um, and at the same time, so is curing cancer. You know? And I hate compromise. And so, you know, what if we could have both? And this is when I started looking into uh, synthetic data. And the idea here is to train a machine learning model to understand the patterns in the data, and then to use that to be able to synthesize new data that is not sensitive. And then you can freely share that. So it sounds great, sounds super promising. But the problem is that machine learning models tend to memorize the training data and then regurgitate it. Um, and there are also lots of instances of sort of adversarial attacks where you can coerce it out of the model parameters. Um, and it's just, again, like anonymization, it's not good enough. So how can we do this uh, with privacy? So fortunately, there are several privacy preserving technologies and there's already been quite a bit of work in applying them to machine learning, especially in supervised learning, uh, but they still suck. Most of the work is optimized for images uh, because that's like the dominant modality in machine learning. Uh, and there's this trade-off between the quality of the data and the privacy level. Uh, and so the results end up being quite mediocre. But in my opinion, this would just be way better. Right? We want to be able to enable hospitals, banks, governments with limited compute to generate high quality privatized data sets that can then be safely released. And we want to optimize this for this ubiquitous tabular data format that underpins most of this core infrastructure. And this is where we enter into the topic of this thesis. So problem statement and research questions. The goal here really is to improve this quality privacy trade-off of generative models. So we see here, if you increase the privacy budget, or relax the amount of privacy, then your quality tends to go up. But we want to extend this area under the curve. We want to synthesize higher quality tabular data sets and still not compromise individual privacy. And so obviously on these axes, there's two key levers here. And these inform the research questions. So the first is, can we increase the data efficiency? If you can make better use of the sensitive training data uh, and thus produce a higher fidelity synthetic data set with the same privacy budget, well, then you win and increase the area under this curve. And you could also think about increasing the training efficiency. If you can have generative models that produce higher fidelity data in fewer training steps because they're more stable and more convergent, then you also use up this privacy budget slower. And so you get way higher quality data at any point along this curve. So a quick overview of the work that was done and what the main contributions were that just frame the rest of the conversation. So I did this extensive literature review and found major gaps uh, in the research. And, and this is looking into you know, deep learning for tabular data, generative modeling, uh, privacy preserving ML, synthetic data evaluation. There was, there was still a lot of major gaps, particularly around tabular data and generative modeling. I then did a bunch of research and found and implemented the four leading techniques on tabular data synthesis and the privacy as a benchmark that was used in the study. And then to try and address the research questions, designed and implemented a bunch of new models. So first I looked at doing novel end-to-end -end generative tabular models that make use of attention mechanisms. Um, and these did really well as autoencoders and they kind of work, but as soon as you add the privacy constraint, the model complexity is too high. So these didn't really work particularly well. Uh, but then I looked into doing uh, novel diffusion models that were optimized for tabular data. Um, and these performed very well, as we'll see later on. So to fully benchmark these, I've designed a comprehensive benchmarking experiment um, to compare all of these leading um, techniques that I implemented um, on multiple real-world data sets against my new models. There's also this big problem of synthetic data evaluation. It's again, particularly hard with tabular data. 
And so I did a lot of research into this and was able to put together a suite of metrics that together give this comprehensive assessment because no metric on an in its own is, is sufficient. And then quantitatively and qualitatively, <laughs> always a thing to say, uh, evaluated the synthetic data sets against the real data sets at varying privacy levels. And the sort of key result here was that the novel diffusion models radically outperformed the state-of-the-art approaches, uh, which are all GANs, across privacy, privacy levels of data sets. Uh, and the result there was way higher quality of the data sets and also greater robustness while still preserving individual privacy. All right, so a little bit of background here uh, just to understand the components that go into this. So firstly, uh, generative models. So the first is VAEs. Now, VAEs use one neural network to encode the data, compressing it down to a latent space, and then use another neural network to decode that data back to the original dimensions. And then by sampling from this latent space, you are able to synthesize uh, new samples. Um, and so VAEs are simple and they're really versatile, but they're generally outperformed by GANs. And the major issue is that this latent distribution must be explicitly specified and the model needs to be constrained to that. And this hampers the convergence and also limits the ability to learn arbitrary real world distributions. Now GANs also make use of two neural networks, but this time they're trained adversarially. Um, so the generator is sampling from random noise to produce samples that hopefully are able to fool the discriminator. And these are popular, they're very effective. Uh, they learn arbitrary distributions implicitly, uh, but they have this really unstable adversarial training paradigm. Uh, and they often suffer from this big issue called mode collapse, which is where they fixate on the most frequent clusters of data and they don't really sample anything else. And both of those are huge problems for what we're trying to do with creating synthetic data under privacy. And then diffusion models are an emerging paradigm. We've really seen them explode over the, the past few years. This is now a single neural network. So it's a much more stable iterative learning process. And it's based on the idea of adding and removing noise. And we'll see how this works in more detail shortly. So like GANs, the diffusion models learn arbitrary distributions implicitly, uh, but they haven't really been explored all that much outside of images. Okay, why is tabular data hard? Well, deep learning is optimized for pictures and they have nice homogeneous features. Uh, they're similar near Gaussian distributions in all of them. Um, and they're in this nice spatially correlated grid structure because of the pixels. Tabular data on the other hand is really challenging. And so these are some examples from the actual data sets used uh, later on in the, in the study uh, where you can see just how tricky some of these uh, distributions end up being. So first you've got a mix of feature types, continuous and discrete. You then also got these very non-Gaussian distributions. You can see an extreme example over here. Um, you've also got high cardinality and imbalance classes in your uh, discrete features, which of course is a huge issue for things like mode collapse. Um, and generally you've just got this high degree of sparsity either upfront or once you pre-process it and try and represent this data in a way from neural networks. Uh, and these are all challenges that are only exacerbated for deep neural networks because deep neural networks love nicely uh, normalized uh, homogeneous data. Um, and you know that's it's one thing, there's some nice tricks for using that as input um, that have been developed over recent years. But for generating that, uh, it's it's pretty much still an unsolved problem and it's really, really hard. And so for this you know, modality, uh, it's a real struggle. Okay, how do we mathematically give some formulation of privacy? The way we do that is with DP, differential privacy. So in our tables, we've got each row being a person and each column is an attribute of that person. And if we have a, a copy of our data set where we've changed a single row, a single person in the data, and then we apply some algorithm like a neural network to that data, then an outside observer shouldn't be able to infer anything about that changed individual, that changed record based on only the algorithm's outputs. And if that's true for everyone in the data set, then the algorithm is differentially private. Um, all the people in the data set effectively have plausible deniability about whether they were in the data set. Um, and it's so important to notice here that DP is a property of the algorithm that does things with data, not of the data itself. Uh, and to make this tractable, what we do is uh, we put some uh, you know, probability on the chance that this outside observer is able to learn anything about any of the records. Um, and then we use a few parameters here. So we have this parameter epsilon that controls the privacy budget um, where lower is more private. And the more sensitive the data, the lower we wanna set that epsilon value. Uh, we also give ourselves a little bit of leeway with this delta parameter, um, but that's usually fixed to a, a tiny value. Uh, 
Now, DP has been rigorously proven and validated in practice over the past two decades, and in particular, this is powerful post-processing guarantee. And what this says is that if we have an algorithm, like a neural network, that's DP, then anything we do with it will also be differentially private to at least the same extent. And so if we release the model or any data synthesized with the model, then it inherits that same level of privacy and no future technology or information can ever decrease that, which is incredibly powerful and useful for what we're trying to do. Okay, great. So we have an idea of how to do differential privacy, but how do we apply this specifically to neural networks? Um, and some uh, more recent research uh, has done this with differentially private stochastic gradient descent. And the key idea here is that before each gradient update of the model, what you want to do is you want to calculate those gradients, but then you want to clip the L2 norm of the gradients to some constant C. So you know, we want to update our gradients here. Um, and first what we do is we apply this gradient clipping um, to, to get everything to that constant C. And then we apply some predetermined Gaussian noise to those gradients. And what this does is it limits the update size during a gradient update for any given sample batch of individuals in the data set, which harkens exactly back to what DP is trying to do. We're, we're limiting how much the model can overfit and learn about any single individual, any given batch of data. Um, there's some very elegant mathematics that goes through proving how this relates back to DP, but it's based on this idea called the moments accountant that lets us quantify the privacy budget consumed by each gradient update. And we can see how this results back to um, the differential privacy here. Q is based on how you do your sampling. Um, and this T is based on the number of training steps. And so obviously you can see if you do fewer training steps, you will use up less of your privacy budget. And this is the key realization going into how we develop better algorithms for using that privacy more efficiently. Um, what's really nice about this is that it's just an operation on the gradients. And so you can apply it to any neural network architecture. Uh, and to any optimizer. So I used Adam because I always use Adam. Um, right, how do we evaluate synthetic data? Well, there's two facets to quality, which is what we care about here. And the two facets are utility and fidelity. Um, and fidelity is really how similar is the real data to the synthetic data, um, vice versa, from a statistical perspective. Uh, whereas utility is the effectiveness for some specific downstream task. So training a model, conducting a particular analysis. Um, and we don't know that task up front, so it's kind of hard to measure that. Um, with fidelity, you've got to measure the marginal distributions as well as the joint distributions, right? Because you can imagine a data set that overall encompasses quite a bunch of the structure of the data, um, but maybe the marginal distributions are completely off the individual features. Um, conversely, you could imagine you know, having really good fit of each feature, but they don't make sense taken together where you have people that are two meters tall and weigh 40 kilograms, both come from a valid distribution, but together they make no sense. So you have to do these um, in combination. Um, and obviously it's quite a challenge to do this different trade-offs with the statistics. Um, so you need a suite of metrics. Um, and the reason why this is hard, again, tabular is hard. In images, you can just look, if your generator is generating a good image, you just look and be like, yeah, that looks like a cat to me. Um, that's a pretty good way of validating it. It's much harder with tabular. You can't really look at it, although we'll see some workarounds for that later on. All right, this brings us on to some of the related uh, work. Um, so there are essentially four leading uh, approaches to generating tabular data, um, most of which work under privacy. Um, they were all GAN-based. So GAN's, again, dominant paradigm. So the first one was PAKE-GAN. Um, and PAKE-GAN actually doesn't use DPSGD. It uses a different method to get differential privacy. And it uses this um, private aggregation of teacher ensembles method, which is pretty clever. Essentially, you're training a whole bunch of different uh, discriminators in your GAN on different subsets of the data. And then you'd sort of like, they vote and you take this average of that to train your actual discriminator. Um, and if you construct this in the right, right way, you can map it back to differential privacy and show that they kind of learned too much about the specifics of any individual sample if they all agree. Um, so quite an interesting method, but really hard to tune. And obviously you've got a lot more models in there. So a lot more networks. And so it's, it's, it takes quite a long time to train. It's a bit fiddly to optimize this. Uh, DPW GAN is a Wasserstein GAN, so it uses um, earth mover distance to help stabilize that game, GAN training process, um, and it just applies differential privacy to that. So quite a nice, simple version of just a privatized GAN that we can compare against. CT GAN is a conditional tabular GAN, so it's optimized for this mixed type tabular data, but it also uses conditional sampling. And this is actually the state of the art in using GANs to synthesize tabular data, but it isn't privatized. 
Um, and the reason for that is part of its magic. And this magic is that you're using a whole bunch of pre-trained, uh, you're training a whole bunch of models um, to understand the distribution and do these really um, interesting analyses of the different modes of the data um, up front. And then you're using that conditionally sampling from that. So giving data to both the discriminator and the generator saying, okay, we're now sampling someone who's like 35 years old or someone who's from this uh, sex or something like that. Um, and you're conditioning on that. And that really helps with things like mode collapse and you get really good results with this. But you can imagine that's really hard to privatize. And then the last one is DP AutoGAN. Um, and the key uh, insight here is that they just thought, let's wrap our GAN inside uh, an auto encoder. Um, so you get a bit of a, Frankenstein architecture. But the idea behind that is that, okay, well, the auto encoder can be pre-trained on the data under privacy to learn a nice representation of the data. So you get around some of those issues of having the data. Um, and then the GAN has this much nicer distribution to try and learn from the model. All right, so a recap of, of what we've covered so far. So remember the aim is to improve this quality privacy trade-off of generative models on top of the data. And we've seen that tabular data is really challenging modality, especially for neural networks, and especially when you're trying to generate. Uh, we have these tools of differential privacy and the gradient descent version of that that gives us a framework for controlling the privacy with downstream guarantees, and this is super powerful. Um, we've also seen that evaluating synthetic data is hard, especially with tabular, and so we use a suite of complementary metrics, and we focus on fidelity to measure quality uh, in an application agnostic way that is also... Um, going to correlate pretty highly with utility if your fidelity is nice and high. Um, and we've seen also that GANs are the dominant generative approach, but they have two main drawbacks. The first is that unstable adversarial training, and the second is the mode collapse issue. All right, so now we get onto the real meat of this. So the first way to try and address this was, what if we could just like get around the challenge of tabular and just represent it with an end-to-end -end model that really understands tabular data? So um, I've extended some research on doing this in the supervised setting um, where you use attention mechanisms over the columns and rows of the tabular data and you learn this really nice dense encoding um, and that's great but the problem is that you still have to deconstruct that um, back to the tabular data so I ended up engineering this complicated mixture density network system in the decoder and using all these tricks to try and reconstruct the tabular data and overall it, it kind of worked what you got is an auto encoder for tabular data that you could train privately and it was pretty good it did really good compression and reconstruction of the data but you, you can't sample from that so you don't have to wrap that um, in around a vae or a gan to generate new samples and this just didn't work right the complexity of the model because of the um, attention mechanisms and because of all these different networks it just ate the privacy budget up too quickly so for this context it doesn't really work bit of a dead end so the next thing was to look at fusion models. So let's briefly just understand the theory of how these work a little bit and then see how we adapt them to tabular. So the key idea is you've got a single network and you train it through the forward diffusion process. And this process works by iteratively adding Gaussian noise to the data, right? So you have um, to get the data at the next uh, diffusion step, you take the, the current data and you just add some Gaussian noise to it. You can see what this looks like over the forward process here. And at each step, what you're doing is you're training the model to understand what noise was added to the data and be able to separate the noise from the data. And so in the reverse process, you start with pure noise and you iteratively apply the model to subtract the noise until you get some new data. Uh, this is really cool um, and really powerful paradigm. How do we apply this to tabular data? Well, this is how we did it. This is the algorithm for training and this is for sampling. And these are some examples showing those forward and reverse processes. It's quite a lot, quite overwhelming. The details aren't super important. Uh, I'll go through what is important. The things that are important is that you can see the training is pretty much like training any supervised or regenerative uh, model. You loop over epochs, you loop over batches, but then you have this inner loop that's over the diffusion process here. And you see this is both in the training and in the sampling, right? And we can see sort of how this then goes through batches of data. So here we have a batch of data um, and it's like tabular data represented as an image now. So you've got each uh, row is a person and each column is a feature. And you can see there's like a lot of sparsity here. Um, and you gradually add noise to this in the forward process. And it's pretty hard to go back, even just looking at that as a human. It's, it's pretty hard to separate the noise from the, from the signal. Uh, but we're training the model to do that uh, through this diffusion step. Um, and then, you know, when we go the other way, we start with random noise um, that we sample from a Gaussian. And we iteratively apply the model. And we get back to something that looks quite a lot like the target distribution that we're going for, especially once you clean that up a bit with some post-processing. The next thing to know is that we use this cosine scheduler 
And we, from that, we scale the noise out of it each step. And the reason we use cosine and not something that's just linear is that um, a bunch of previous research and diffusion models has shown that this gives you a 10x improvement in how quickly your model converges. So you only need to use, like, I only used five steps here to get really good results. Um, and that's a huge uh, increase in uh, the stability and, and, and training performance of the model using that cosine scheduler. The next thing to note is that our actual gradient uh, clipping and noising that we do for differential privacy happens outside of this inner diffusion model loop. And this is really powerful because it means that our models are able to learn from the same data multiple times, augmented each time by adding in this noise through the diffusion process before we have to take any gradient cost. Um, and, and, and that therefore means a privacy cost. Um, and so you're getting way more um, data leverage here, um, similar to how in computer vision, you might um, add you know, augmentations to your data. And finally, we implemented two different variants of this. So we discussed how you might use the model to predict the noise and then you subtract the noise. We also implemented a variant where we just denoise the data directly. Um, and, and, and the reason for this is to really tease apart in the ablation study, which component here of, of, of this design is really giving the fusion models their um, performance. Um, and we'll see that the noise predicting variant actually performs a lot better. Um, and that tells us quite a lot. Okay, so the experimental design. As mentioned, implemented the four leading DAM-based approaches, uh, used CTGAN, uh, which is not privatized, as the benchmark for sort of the ideal case of tabular quality, right? So if you can hit that, that's like amazing performance, especially under privacy, because it's not privatized and it's the best one. Um, the two variants of the table diffusion model, which is what I called it, uh, for the ablation study, so we can really tease apart the key mechanisms. Uh, and then we did this all for 10 repeated runs at eight different privacy levels on two different real world data sets. And these were challenging mixed type data sets with you know, tens of thousands of people and dozens of features. In order to sort of control for everything as much as possible and really tease apart, sort of like, we want to eliminate all of the random variables and all of the things that are due to that implementation details. So we control as many variables as possible by using a shared core neural network architecture based on a residual MLP that was shown in CTGAN to work quite well, shared pre-processing scheme, the same privacy budgets and accounting, and the same hyperparameter tuning protocols. Uh, we also use a fixed seed schedule um, over the 10 repeated runs so that each uh, model had the same seeds for each run, um, not the same seeds, but the same sequence of seeds uh, to lock down as many random variables as possible. All right, um, and finally, our data fidelity metrics. So we use these really good alpha precision and beta recall metrics that have been recently developed. And the goal here is to maximize these. These are a generalization of precision and recall from classification problems, but you apply them to higher dimensions and you tailor them to synthetic data evaluation. Essentially, you're drawing hyperspheres around the real and around the synthetic data and counting how much the other data set falls within um, that distribution. And then when you integrate over those, like get the area under the curve, combine them together, you get a really nice metric that um, measures fidelity of the joint distribution. Another way we can measure that is to train a logistic regression model to distinguish the real and synthetic data and use the probability ratio as a score. And that's something you want to minimize. And then you've also got to look at the marginal distributions. And here you can just use pretty standard statistical tests on the different features and aggregate those together. Um, and that's something again to minimize. And so here we get a bit of a holistic understanding. And so here is the first result. Um, and this is essentially that shows that we get way higher fidelity joint distributions. So each plot here is a different data set. Um, on the, the x-axis here, we have the privacy budget. So it's very um, small budget, very high privacy, and that increases. And then we have the performance here. And the goal like, with these area under the PRC curves is to maximize them. Those are the alpha beta metrics we saw earlier. And we can see that the table diffusion model here in blue and the denoising variant just massively outperform all the other models. They even outperform this unprivatized CTGAN benchmark that is the dotted line. Um, and they show these beautiful curves where they um, produce higher fidelity data as you relax your privacy budget, as we expect in that trade-off, but you're just getting so much more at every point along that curve. So this is the sort of key result. We can also see from the error bars that particularly the, um, the noise predicting variant is much more consistent in its results. And if you look at the marginals, you see something quite similar. So this is a, a subset of the marginal distributions from one of our data sets on this top row here. Um, and you can see like the GAN really struggles. It, it can't get these non-Gaussian distributions. It really wants to just fit a nice bell curve to those as much as possible. You can also see that these kind of like minor classes just get dropped all the time. That's the mode collapse issue. You can see it all over the place. Um, 
Whereas our table diffusion here on the bottom, it does a pretty good, not perfect, but a pretty good job of, of reconstructing um, the distributions, especially when they're non normal. And it does a really good job of representing these sort of minority classes and getting the ratios quite right um, of the class frequencies there. So, overall, very impressive marginal results as well. Another key thing is that the diffusion models avoid mode collapse. Here's one of our data sets uh, projected down to two dimensions with PCA and put in like a heat map. Um, and you can see that the WGAN, um, it just mode collapses to kingdom come and it just finds these four clusters that it likes and it overfits on them. Whereas table diffusion does a really good job of recreating um, and, and representing all of those different modes. Um, it's pretty hard to tell apart. Another key thing is that these diffusion models are really stable and robust. If you look over the course of logging during training here, uh, how the epsilon, which is the privacy budget, is consumed. You see that the table diffusion models here in blue just have these much smoother, more gradual curves. They use it up really nicely and smoothly um, over this iterative process. Whereas the GAN just uses a ton of the budget right away and then it has to sip away slowly as it struggles to converge. We see this as well in the loss curves. The, the diffusion models just have these beautiful um, loss curves that you love to see in deep learning, whereas the GAN is, is all over the place. It's the generator loss, and you can see it's just bouncing around all over and really struggling to converge. Um, and that's obviously eating up the privacy budget way too quickly. Um, and so overall here, you can see these are all the minimized metrics that we discussed earlier. Um, the diffusion models, again, in, in blue and, and, and pink, compare really well to the state of the art tabular um, GAN models. Um, and you know, they're, they're consistently outperforming across the different privacy levels and often outperforming the unprivatized benchmark of CT GAN, which is that gray dotted line. Um, you know, at, at even sometimes very strict privacy levels. So I was quite amazed by this. These are really strong results. Um, it just shows the power of the fusion models compared to GANs. And finally, we want to look at this ablation study um, comparing. So here are our, our real data sets, again, PCA projected. Um, here's our diffusion setup that predicts the noise, which you see does a really good job of representing uh, both data sets. And here we see the denoise variant. Um, and it just, it doesn't do quite as well. Um, it tends to mode collapse a bit more. It's not quite as faithful a, a, a reputation. And this is echoed in, in the other metrics as well. Um, and so a key thing is that the diffusion model that predicts the noise, and then we subtract that, that, that paradigm is really, really powerful and really good for getting robust results. And that's a, a key takeaway. So in conclusion, our aim was to improve this quality privacy trade-off of generative models and synthesize higher quality tabular data sets without compromising privacy. We were able to do this by increasing data efficiency. Um, we didn't do it through the tabular uh, representation um, with the attention-based models, but we did it by doing that sample augmentation with the diffusion models, where they're getting to see the same data again and again augmented in different ways with the noise and just train a lot more for each privacy uh, hit that we had to take, um, which pushes up our curve. And we also increased the training efficiency by actually having way more stable training compared to GAN. So it was much more tractable learning process, those smoother learning curves. So both of these work together um, and increase our data quality at any given privacy budget and effectively achieve the aim. And so the two major takeaways from this whole presentation from all of this work that I think are, 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 benefit, are beneficial to keep in mind, one, diffusion models are a powerful generative paradigm with numerous advantages over everything we've seen before. They're still mostly underexplored in non-image modalities. And secondly, we've developed new high-performing tools that mobilize sensitive tabular data sets. And what this means is that high-value data sets, especially in biomedical domains, are going to become increasingly accessible to researchers and practitioners. In the future, we can throw the immense capabilities of AI at solving humanity's most important problems. And so I'm very excited about this, very happy with the results. And, and yeah, thank you for your time.